Okay, unfortunately, I have a PowerPoint. <laughs> but it's more of a, um, thank you. It's more of a flashcard PowerPoint, meaning there's not a lot of words and there's a lot of pictures. And my thinking for doing it this way was that you probably wouldn't be able to use the whole PowerPoint with your students, but there are probably some good slides that you could use because they're simple enough to get the points across that we want um, to hopefully get across. Okay, so let's go to the first one, Peter. We've already done a little bit of this. Mary's talked about some of this stuff. Um, let's just have a brainstorm session to shout it right out when you know about how we benefit from the ocean. Anyone? Oh, food. food. Relaxation. Rain. Relaxation. Rain. Rain. Oh, very good. What else? Transportation. Recreation. Recreation. Keep going. Transportation. Transportation. Jewelry. Jewelry. Shells. <laughs> Which leads to a bigger picture of what? Economics, maybe? Oh, economics. What else? Medicine. Medicines. Oxygen. Excellent. Oxygen. So could we exist without the ocean? No. no. We may not have fancy jewelry, but you're right. We could not. We're completely interdependent. And that's um, the whole point of principle six in your ocean literacy brochure that Peter mentioned, that humans and oceans are inextricably interconnected. Okay, so that's what we're gonna talk about. Go ahead, Peter. So here's um, the sim simple parts here. We get jobs, a lot of people work with ocean-related jobs, I'm one of them. I do education with ocean-related ocean topics. Go ahead. Recreation we mentioned, keep going. Commerce, Mary talked a little bit about that, keep going. This is one we didn't mention. How many people are actually have heard of energy from oceans? Good, okay, yeah, but it's not in the forefront of your mind, right? Um, do you know what types of energy we get from the ocean? Thermal. Tidal. Tidal. It's Waves. It's generating electricity. Yeah, hydroelectric. Oil. Oil. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, that's, 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 that's well, actually whale oil. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's very creative. Have you heard of methane in the oceans? Sure. Yeah, a lot of methane deposits, and there's actually people thinking about how we can harness that energy. Great. Now we're blowing to, yeah. It's, well, they haven't figured out a way yet, so we're going to hope that stays. Mom. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one <laughs> There's not, not a good way to do it because it's all pressurized. And, and when you, it's kind of like with the deep water horizon thing, the methane was being released and it was hard to cap it. Something about that, I'm not quite sure what, but okay, keep going. Climate, somebody mentioned rain. Beautiful. Climate is controlled by reactions, complicated reactions that we don't even quite understand this relationship between oceans and atmosphere. Okay, we're just starting to figure that out with the whole climate change thing. But the good news is we are, we're on it. <laughs> so keep going, Peter, please. All right, Melly mentioned medicines. And uh, this statistic, one in 10, this was actually an informal survey done by the New England Aquarium in Boston. It was a number of years ago, maybe six or seven years ago. One in 10 was the number of people who could name a connection between oceans and their own health. Can you think of any? Salt, mercury, salt, and fish. Salt, mercury and fish. Yeah, great, what else? My calcium pills have yeah. oyster shells. And yes, perfect. Iodine. What else? Source of, source of iodine. Source of iodine? Horseshoe crab blood. Horseshoe crab blood. <laughs> Do you teach us stuff? <laughs> Did you peek? Um, anything else? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll get into that a little bit um, deeper in just a second. Peter, can you flip? Okay. So here's some of the things. Here's your bone graphs from bamboo coral, because that coral is almost identical to human bone. Go figure, who knew? Wouldn't that be cool to check 
<laughs> yeah. Um, deep sea sponges are a big source of anti inflammatory and anti tumor potential. And um, one of the things that we're finding is that a lot of the organisms that are sessile, which is attached to the bottom and cannot move, like a sponge or like um, this guy is a tunicate, which is just kind of a stalked organism. Um, a lot of those kinds of organisms, the sessile ones, are most promising. If we think about it, can you think about that? You have to think a little deep about that. Why would that be? Okay, well, if you're sessile, you're sitting on the bottom, you can't go anywhere, you've got all this stuff in the water column coming at you, right? There's bacteria, there's all kinds of icky parasites. So what do you have to be able to do? You have to adapt, and you probably want to have something in your body to fight them off, right? So there's our antibacterial properties. Um, say you are, you have your own little space on the bottom, you're living happily on the bottom, and suddenly this little larvae of something comes in and wants to move in next to you. Well, food is scarce enough. Do you want competition? No way. You can zap them, yeah. Some of these, these guys have, um, they inhibit cell division. So think of the implications of that. It's huge. Okay, so these are just some examples. The one on the bottom I'll mention, um, the cone snail has a toxin that is more potent than morphine and non-addictive. Okay, so the one that they've been kind of trying to, to, um, to culture. <laughs> well, they finally made something out of the cone snail's uh, painkiller. I think it's called Prealt. But now they found, so after all this work and all this expense and all this research, they found that it's only good for, they only use it for people who do not respond to morphine. So pain that does not respond to morphine because it has side effects. So it has uh, neurological side effects like dizziness and disorientation and hallucination. Sorry? Yeah, I think they're a little worse though. So not ideal, but the good news on the cone snails is that there are 500 species of cone snails and each of them make 100 different toxins. So we have a lot of work to do. But, okay, keep on going. Okay, so here's one of the, the simple flashcard type things that you might be able to use. Okay, sponge is not really a word that your students might know right off the bat, but um, we talked about food, we've got seaweed, we've got our seafood, seaweed becomes food, keep going. Okay, that brings us to our first activity, actually our only activity. Um, are there algae in your house? Not the kind that you just bring in on your flip flop coming from the beach, but in a different form. Yeah, okay, everybody knows about that, right? Um, okay, well we have a little exercise in that. And I was thinking about this and thinking, okay, if I was with a, you know, maybe a level three or four student, this might be just something to get them used to word recognition. So what I'm going to do is pass out a bunch of labels, all of stuff I've eaten, <laughs> and let you figure out, if you go to the next slide, you figure out your ABCs and see what, what kinds of seaweed you can find in these products. And I don't think I have quite enough for everybody, but if you share. So this is just an awareness activity. One, and you guys share. That's for you. And see what you come up with. So this is what you're looking for from the different types of algae. You don't have to pronounce it. Just look for that word recognition. <laughs> Who's done? You're done. You're done. Okay, can you just hold up your label and tell us what you found in it? Okay, so you've got, let's we'll start here. Beta carotene from green algae. Beta carotene is usually a coloring. It's like a yellow-orange coloring, comes from green algae, go figure. You just want the seaweed? Yeah, 
Oh, okay. So we have the same thing, beta carotene. Okay. But there is salt and there fish in here too. Salt, salt and salt. fish. All right. And the sour cream here and it has carotene. Excellent. Thickening agent. My toothpaste has that too. Some of those are German chocolate cakes. <laughs> <laughs> Frosting. Yeah, okay, let's keep going. You have. This is a vegan veal roast and it has uh, Irish moss, the sea fish. Yeah, isn't that funny? This has carrageenan also. Yeah, ice cream. That's a big one. What do you have? What in it? Carrageenan. What do, you, what do you have in yours? What is that? What do you have? He's got Progresso soup. Oh, chicken soup. Yeah, well, I'm just carrying it. You're holding it up backwards. Yeah. And you have carrot, you have carrot, 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 No. Yep. What do you have? No. Beta carotene. I was saying, I've read beta carotene. Oh, okay. I have carotene. And you have? In uh, the loose. Chocolate loose. <laughs> Good. In the uh, Progresso soup, there's beta carotene. You get that nice color for the soup that way. <laughs> Toothpaste. Colgate. Um, it has carrageenan also, the caramel truffle. Yeah, my favorite. Mary? Oh, German chocolate cake, carrageenan. Excellent. Black forest cake, carrageenan. I think it's mostly in the frosting. Yeah. But sure is good. Very weird food bar. Has a lot of that was my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I you guys are harsh. But it's beta carotene. Yeah, there's beta carotene in there. That was a surprise for me when I looked at that. I said, I gotta save this. All right, great. So the other things I have, these are just a little bonus. These are um, these are rice crackers that have seaweed in them. So I'm gonna open them and you can all try them. I don't know how good they are. I've never had one. And these look a little more interesting. These are sea chips. They're main Coast sea vegetables. And I had to get these at the National Food Store, not at Stop and Shop or Publix. So you can try these if you want. <laughs> I said you can try these. <laughs> They're very good for you, but. Okay, I'm gonna back up just a second. Because I forgot to mention this. Did you? Yeah, there's a lot of different seaweed. Who has who saw who saw the Key Largo Press, the most recent or two issues ago? That says Coral Cure on the front. Coral Cure? Question mark. This is oceans and uh, medicines from the sea again. There's this. They found this um, algae that shows promise as a colon cancer medicine. Okay, and the most interesting part, most interesting phrase in this article to me was they were looking at the ingredients, there was this chemistry professor from the University of Florida, get this, who found that the extract was potent to cancer cells, but far more benign for healthy ones. What do we do with that? Well, we need some seaweed. But how does it know that the healthy cells did not need the cancer fighting Ability. This fascinates me. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Okay, so back to the food. Did this, does this blah, 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 surprise anybody that there were this many products? No. No? no? Yes? No. Maybe? Surprise yeah. me. Sometimes. Good. Okay. So again, just an awareness thing. Melissa? Yes? Question for you. Uh, I mean, I know that the algae is necessary for coral development in sustenance. Uh, are any of these mined from coral? Are they mined? I don't think so. That wouldn't be very good for the coral. Yeah, that would. No, the coral oh, have little zooxanthellae, which are that live in there for that symbiotic relationship that gives them color. That's why when the coral bleaching, you hear about coral bleaching, that algae is dead inside. But I don't think we mine the coral for for algae. These are easier to come by. They might be some. You know, like whatever's listed on those kelp and dulse, dulse, how do you pronounce that? Dulse. 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 Things that are probably easier to just collect. <coughs> Next. Okay, so this is just kind of a quick wrap up. We haven't got to the biomedical applications yet, but we will. So we've already talked about these. Let's keep going. 
And this is a very simple um, trailer that actually was used for, again, developed by the New England Aquarium and used in aquariums for exhibits on oceans and human health. But it's simple enough. I don't think we have. There you go. OK. Got to be quiet. There might be that cultural connection for your students, right? So just kind of a nice wrap up for that section. Hmm? For that section anyway. Okay, we're not going to do this because we don't really have too much time. Let's keep going. Um, biomedical applications. We talked a little bit about the medicines, but there's other ways that animals are helping us. Marine animals are helping to um, teach us more about human health, and that's. Um, as biomedical models. So we're using these animals to find out about ourselves because we have a lot of similarities with them, believe it or not. So for example, the squid teaches us about um, nerves because it has this absolutely huge nerve cells that are a thousand times bigger than ours. So we can look at those easily in the lab and learn more about our nerves. Go. The spiny dogfish helps with vision. Keep going. Horseshoe crab, you mentioned that before. There's a, a compound in the horseshoe crab blood that they can use to test for impurities, um, primarily in intravenous medications. The flounder, we're learning, learning about um, kidney excretions. and Sea urchins lay thousands of eggs, so they're pretty easy to study. The toadfish, this is one of my favorites. You guys have toadfish here? Right? Mm -hmm. We don't have those, I don't think, too much where I am. But um, the inner ear is almost identical to the human ear, inner ear. So we can learn about balance disorders. A toadfish actually went into outer space for that very purpose on one of the space shuttles. Um, this list is not meant for you to actually read in detail or learn, but this is just to give you an idea of how many animals are being used for research like this. And if you keep going, Peter. There's more, and the list goes on and on and on. There's hundreds of them. That's not something that you really hear about. I don't know why, because I think it's so interesting, but um, this will tell you more about the toadfish. No, 40 seconds? 
Huh? 40 seconds? Go to 40. Back in. Uh, back in. Yep. Thank you, Father. It's okay. 40, damn, 40. 40. 40. <laughs> <laughs> right. That body. Or 30 something. Body. That's good. Good, good. Uh, sorry. Okay. No, that's good. You're uh, fine. Uh, it's only seven seconds. Uh, okay. This is just the intro. Okay, you can stop it there. That's actually a nine minute video, so I don't think we're gonna go through all that. But um, So that was our biomedical section. Sorry to be rushing through this. Um, we talked about culture yesterday, right? Mary and then Margaret the day before that, and how we can integrate that into the teaching. So just again, to consider how the ocean plays a role in the heritage of many cultures. A lot of people are fisher people. Um, some people may have come to this country on a ship or a boat or no, a lot of different ways. Next. Okay, we'll have another brainstorm session. Just shout out. What kind of risks might there be from the ocean to humans? Drowning. Drowning. <laughs> Storm surge. Storm surge. Sea level rise. Sea level rise. Water spouts. Water spouts. What else? What about things that might make you sick? Painted fish with mercury. Yeah. Or? Oh, Oil spills. Oil spills. <laughs> Oil spills. Sorry? Cholera. Okay, very good. Click. Jaws. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Go ahead, Peter. Okay, here are some. Nobody mentioned harmful algal blooms. Oh. Red tides. Yeah. Um, red tide, storm, seafood poisoning. Next slide, please. And Interestingly, most people live near the coast. I think there's some huge percentage of us that live within 75 miles of the coast, right? So these are all, these are important. Um, we talked about storms, somebody mentioned that. And again, this is the really simplified version, you guys, just so that if you want to use it, you can. We don't go into great depth about anything. Alga blooms, they're not always bad. They actually occur quite regularly and frequently. In, in fresh water too. The Great Lakes have them, rivers have them. Um, these are just two, um, I have two slides on fish poisoning. Anybody ever suffered from fish or shellfish poisoning? Oh, that's good, okay. <laughs> Sounds pretty awful to me. I don't eat shellfish, but um, these would be some of your symptoms. Next. If you ate something that was contaminated by the red tide algae, these might be some of your symptoms. Symptom, oops, back up. Symptoms similar to CFP, that just means the previous slide, ciguatera, fish poisoning. So not good stuff. Okay, so that's a little bit about how the, the, some of the dangers or risks that the ocean presents to us. 
How do we impact the ocean? We've heard about, we've talked about how the ocean impacts us for better or worse. How do we impact the ocean? Word. Sorry? Pollution. Pollution. What else? Fishing. Overfishing. What else? Drilling. Drilling. Sure. Anything else? Um, well, well, like ships when they sink, you know, I mean, it's. They, they're kind of, if they have uh, pollutants on the ship and. and uh, yeah, do you know we have, we have oh, I don't know how many ships out there um, that have oil on them or other pollutants that we're just waiting to rust away and oops, then what? It's another one of my professional interests. <laughs> um, what did you say? CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions. For warming oceans. Okay. Okay, so for these, yeah, runoff, of course. What, um, what do you think is the greatest contributor? Out of these pictures, negative. I'm hearing agriculture. How many people think agriculture runoff, non-point source pollution? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. How many people think oil, not including Deepwater Horizon? How many people think air pollution? <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's. Um, it's the agricultural runoff, fertilizers and things that create that dead zone. So as Mary was saying, it's hard to get people in Indiana to think about this. But, you know, all of that goes to the sea. No matter how far away you live, it, eventually it gets to the sea. Okay, next slide. Okay, somebody mentioned overfishing. I just thought that was cute. Not really cute, but... Um, and the lionfish, do you know why that's on there? Invasive species. Yeah, invasive species, which are species that may not normally have evolved to live here, but we introduce them and then they disrupt the food chain or the habitat, whatever. And Melly's going to talk a little bit about the lionfish. Next one. Um, what about development? Chop down those mangroves, build some condos. Yeah, mangroves save lives. Melly's going to talk about that too. Go ahead, Peter. Um, so that's it for me. These are ways I always like to end on a positive note because otherwise it's all doom and gloom and oh, we're going downhill and what can we do? I feel so helpless. It's beyond me. Well, it's not. There are things. Everybody makes a difference. So these are some things that you can do. So we'll figure out how to get this PowerPoint accessible to you either on the website or whatever. Maybe on Ocean Speak. On Ocean Speak, yes, oh. if you want to use it. Yeah. But do you have questions? Comments? Cool.